<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us here in the library. This is the beginning of a new season of Prime Time in the Bethel Library. Uh, Prime Time is not just Yahoo's like us. Um, it celebrates uh, learning in and beyond the classroom for faculty, uh, students, staff, and is a collaborative project between the library and the friends of the library and faculty development and several other offices on campus that I'm almost certainly forgetting. Uh, this program uh, meets on Tuesday and Thursdays during community time, uh, and you can catch a schedule of those things on the library website, e-announcements, uh, and an event calendar uh, for upcoming presentations. Um, and today, uh, we're here to record, as well as live, um, do a podcast of election shock therapy, which is a podcast um, produced by um, station manager Sam Mulberry. Um, <laughs> Is, and we've been running this podcast for about three, three years, since 2016. Since 2016 year. So three, 2016 years now, for now, um, <laughs> for three years now. And um, uh, this is in celebration specifically of Constitution Day. More on that in a second. So thanks for, thanks for joining us. Why am I? Why am I here? Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Tear down this wall, and the wall just got ten feet tall. We're going to California, and Texas, and New York, we're going to South Dakota, and Oregon, and Washington, and Michigan, and then we're going to Washington, D.C., and then we're going to White House. For the Bethel University Library here at Bethel University, it's election shock therapy. Break the class. Yes. We're live. This is not a clap track. <laughs> How would you feel if we had a clap track? It's like sort of this like a little laugh line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 60 show. Yeah. I say something. It really depends like on how well they do today. Because yeah. you can be replaced. So. <laughs> Well, uh, we're live because it is September 17th, and everybody knows what that means, right? Oh, yeah. It's Constitution, Constitution Day. Day. Now, yesterday was Constitution Eve, so I assume you hung your Bill of Rights by the, by the, by the mantle, right? Um, yeah, Jefferson came down and ate the cookies. You know. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Did James Madison bring you all the amendments you voted for? Not all of them. He, he left some of them up. Uh, we, should do a quick, point. we should do a quick introduction. You are uh, Matt Kugum, Andy Bramson, and I'm Chris Moore. And um, we're here with an audience today. Um, and we decided for Constitution Day today, rather than us delving into one of our esoteric topics, was to solicit some questions. So we're going to do that in two ways. Um, Matt, you've already pulled your uh, introduction to political science students. And they've submitted some questions that we're going to work through. And then I think if we have some time at the end here, we're also going to take some questions from the audience as well. And Sam's got a handheld mic for that. And if you want to write your question down, we'd really appreciate that. And um, we've got some pencils and some paper here if you want to jot down a question for us. Uh, first of all, uh, Andy, what is Constitution Day? Why do we celebrate this? Well, so once upon a time, um, there was a senator from West Virginia named Robert Byrd. And Robert Byrd attached uh, a writer, a very old and crusty senator, very old and crusty senator who loved the Constitution very much, and he attached a he writer was, to was a there funding for the bill. Signing. Right, <laughs> almost. Um, <laughs> so he attached a writer to a, a funding bill that said every um, institution of higher education that receives federal funding, which is most of us, um, has to celebrate the Constitution on Constitution Day. Um, now a lot of schools actually ignore this and do nothing at all, um, and nothing bad happens to them because this is an unenforced mandate. Um, but at Bethel, we're very conscientious about this, and we always make a deliberate attempt to remember our Constitution and celebrate it on this day. Um, so that's what we're doing. So, to be clear, there's an, un an unenforceable federal mandate that we have decided to um, assiduously follow. To respect well, because we're real followers, right? Yeah, we are. All right, so, we got some, uh, uh, Matt, we got some really good questions from we your did. class here. We did. I was, I was impressed. impressed. Yeah, we had probably 50 or 60 submissions, and there was a whole bunch of them that were top notch. I'd say. Now, I should just to say up front here: Are there any questions that you were hoping they didn't ask, or questions you were hoping not to answer? What is the Constitution? That yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> sure. What is the Bill of Rights? Uh -huh. Et cetera. Et cetera. Okay. How does a bill become a law? Exactly. Okay. Sure. I didn't want to break out the schoolhouse rock and, and embarrass ourselves. Yeah. I, I can't carry it too. I don't know about you guys. All right. 
we do have some really good questions here. So without further ado, I want to dive into this. And I'm going to play host to this. I'm the international relations guy. Um, and uh, we're better at ignoring constitutions than actually following them. So I'm, I'm going to look to my comparativist and theorist friends here. And I want to start with, I think, one of the more, one of the more uh, broad sweeping questions that your students asked us. And this was it's the, as follows. Was the Constitution written to be a self-consciously landmark document? Or was it simply used for compromise? What's the very nature of the Constitution? I would answer this question as yes. Um, <laughs> I think it is both. Uh, I think it's, it is certainly the case, when you look at the writings of the founders, that they, they realized this was an important moment, and that they, there was a sense in which the eyes of the world were upon them. I mean, they, they'd broken away from um, the greatest power of the time. Um, they were trying to self-govern, not just as sort of these individual entities and states, but as a larger group. And there was a real question of whether this could succeed or not. And so they realized that there was, you know, that people were watching to see, could this work? Um, and so they did have that sense of history that, you know, this matters. And this matters beyond just simply this moment for us governing ourselves, but also for, you know, human governance. Um, having said that, it is also the case, I think, that the, the Constitution is very much a series of compromises. I mean, why do we have a House and a Senate? Right, that's a direct result of the fact that large states are saying we have to have representation by population. Small states are saying we are states, we have this individual sovereignty, and we're not coming in unless you recognize that. And so in the end we said, okay, we'll do both. <laughs> right? We'll give you the Senate, and that'll be about states, and we'll give you the House, and that'll be about population. So I think it's, it's both. To say nothing of the three-fifths three -fifth compromise for oh, slavery as well. Right. Right. Um, massive compromise. Uh, Matt, what do you think? Is this, is this a landmark? document? Is this a compromise? It is. I mean, they're very, I mean, as Andy pointed out, they're very self-conscious about uh, this particular moment in history that they were occupying. So if you look at, um, some of you might be familiar with the Federalist Papers, and that's in which some of the people who helped write the Constitution uh, laid out their defense of why the Constitution ought to be ratified in the states. And at the very beginning of those set of papers, and there's, there's a whole bunch of them, there's dozens, um, Alexander Hamilton, um, in, in the first paragraph, said, um, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved for the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Mm. And basically they were trying to figure out like is this going to be a moment in which we can arise above what has typically happened in history in which political systems are simply the products of, of change and flux and accident, or we can be able to rise above that and put together a constitution um, through, uh, through deliberation um, and through actual decision. Hamilton sounds very aspirational there, too. Like, yes. like, it's not clear that this is actually, we're actually going to pull this off, no. um, but we're going to give it a try. Right, and that's another thing a lot of people don't realize, is that there was, it was not certain at all that the constitution was going to be ratified. It was actually ratified um, well, first of all, it was not clear whether or not it was going to get out of the Constitutional Convention. Um, and then once it got out of the Convention, um, it was not clear whether or not a sufficient number of states were going to actually ratify it so that it would go into force. Um, and so that's why we had a debate over, over, over a year, basically, in which you had people writing these papers back and forth um, in newspapers and pamphlets, um, debating whether or not we should adopt this new form of government. Um, and it was not at all clear what the outcome was going to be. In fact, the Federalist Papers that you just referenced are an attempt to basically win that debate in New York, right? Which was, I mean, one of the interesting things they had early on, too, is that a number of states did ratify, but Virginia and New York were more reluctant. And Virginia and New York were the two big power players in the early Republicans. So you're not going to be able to form a viable country, right, without them signing on. Uh, so the Federalist Papers are Madison, Hamilton, and Jay trying to say, hey, New York, we really, um, this is a good idea. You really need to vote for this. So, um, and I, I tend to, like most Americans, tend to take the Constitution for granted. I just think this has always been here. It's a monolith. That always, it's always informed us, and it really has. But for, for those uh, authors, at the time that they were lobbying for its passage, what was Plan B if it hadn't made it out of the convention, if it hadn't been ratified by the states? Is there a counterfactual in history that would have been, seems obvious, that we'll, where we might have ended up instead? I always kick it to our historian on that, but, but as far as I know, I mean, there wasn't a clear idea of what would happen next, because at that point, the Articles of Confederation were in force. The Articles of Confederation basically formed a very, very weak national-level government um, that was very ineffective at the time. And so basically, if the Constitutional Convention um, didn't produce a constitution that was ratified, 
article of the convention would have remained in force, and then who knows what would have happened then. There might have been an attempt to do some sort of reform of the articles. That was one of the options that was on the table during the Constitutional Convention, so that could have been the next thing that they would have tried, but, but who knows? <coughs> Let's go to one of the other questions from your class here, um, and this also takes us all the way back to the beginning, or very early on, and also back to John Jay, as it turns out. So here's the question. How do we know today how to interpret the Constitution, one that was written in a culture that has vastly changed without losing the original intent? There's a couple of loaded phrases in there, but let's un let, let you guys unpack this. How do we interpret the Constitution? Well, uh, so, I, so let's just back up and, and think about the question. So, so I would suggest that interpreting the Constitution is challenging, but isn't itself necessarily a super difficult thing to do. So, so if we take the example, so here at Bethel, we're familiar with biblical exegesis, right? And it turns out interpreting scriptures can be quite challenging because it's done in a different language, because we might have different art, we might have different uh, fragments of scripture that uh, might not always um, have the exact same, uh, the exact same language. It's a different culture, it's a different time, and so we have to do a lot more legwork to interpret scripture. Uh, on the other hand, the Constitution was written only a couple hundred years ago. It was written in modern English, um, and it's. And there's a lot of secondary documents and things that we can look to to try to understand what was going on when the Constitution was being developed. And so the job of interpreting the text of the Constitution itself isn't super difficult. Um, the more interesting question, and the one that's being debated, is how much emphasis should we put on looking at the text and the original meaning of the Constitution, or should we try to look beyond the text or use the text as a springboard to developing other sorts of interpretations that allow us to address problems that people perceive as, as um, not being sufficiently addressed in the Constitution. And so, so the real debate um, has to do with whether or not we should stick to the meaning and the text or if we should go beyond it. And that's where the real uh, controversy is. And so one of the one of the phrases we often latch on to that you know creates these kind of controversies is necessary and proper, right? And what is necessary and proper for the government to do what it has to do, right? And we debate that quite a lot, right? I mean, do you do you interpret this like no, it can only do those things that are explicitly listed, right? Or can it do anything necessary and proper that might in some way help you to achieve kind of those those broader goals? Um, so that's one of the ones you debate. And the other is the Tenth Amendment, which I, you know, I was born in South Carolina, right in the Deep South. We love the Tenth Amendment, right? And and the Tenth Amendment essentially says, right, that everything not given explicitly to this new national constitution is reserved to the states. So those powers are reserved for the states, for the original sovereign entities. And the South took that very seriously, right, and said, you, know, you can't do anything beyond um, what is explicitly written. Over time, we've certainly expanded sort of our understanding of what we think the national government can do, and com conversely, some of the power has been lost in the states. Commercial break. Since you mentioned the Tenth Amendment, I think we have to uh, see what Chris has on his T-shirt. Well, no one on, no one who's listening to this can see my T-shirt, but I'm wearing. That's why you have to come uh, to live the, Well, there's a picture on Facebook. The much prized, <laughs> much prized T-shirt says the United States Constitution, copyright 1791, all rights reserved. <laughs> yeah. A reference to the Tenth Amendment. Exactly. Um, all right, I'm going to put you guys in the spot a little bit since you called out my t shirt. Uh, we have a couple terms that often get floated around in modern uh, judicial parlance, uh, specifically around the Supreme Court. Words like textualist and originalist, and that's often ascribed to certain members of the court. What do those two, what do those words mean, and how do we classify our, our current Supreme Court justices in terms of how they interpret the Constitution? Do you want to take a crack first? <laughs> so, such it. an expert on Supreme Court. Um, so you're asking textualist, originalist? That's probably, honestly, like I feel a, a little ill-equipped to answer that well. So let me, let, 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 me, let me roll this over one by, This is what I'm curious about. So um, in the recent confirmation hearings for, uh, for Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, for example, one of the questions uh, at the core of their legal thinking was, how do they view the Constitution as a document, and uh, especially uh, as a replacement for Antonin Scalia? Scalia was famously an originalist and was attempting to discern what the original intent of the writers right, of the Constitution right. meant when they were um, uh, uh, in, 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 in applying the law. Um, uh, what, what, um, I guess what I'm, what I'm curious about is how do these current ju these new justices approach the law, are they, are they doing the same sort of thing? Are they originalists? I mean, I can give a, I, I'll take a broad stroke step at this, but I don't want to try to like parse the, 
the different nine ju judges because I think there are nuances, and this is where I, I think the people who actually study the court would want to be much more nuanced. Um, but I mean, broadly speaking, there's this debate between do we think about the Constitution as a living document that we sort of we spring off that we we can we sort of expand the powers as needed to kind of answer the the concerns of modern society, right? Or do we think about this much more, and this is more the originalist school, what did they actually originally intend? We have to stick to that. The law becomes meaningless if we um, you know, start expanding it into things that they did not intend. Um, and so we have to be sort of pretty strictly bound to that law. And if you want to change that, you actually have to amend the Constitution, pass laws that accord with that. So roughly speaking, right, I mean, that first group I described is going to correspond to what we call more the liberal wing of the, the court. And the um, second would be the conservative wing, and the new judges we have, of course, that Jim Kavanaugh certainly fit into that latter category. But uh, beyond that, I feel a little uncomfortable trying to parse it because I just know that I'm I'm going to trip across one of these things where my constitutional scholar friends would be like, "No, you got that wrong," <laughs> and they'd be right. I mean, so so there is a little bit of daylight between sort of the originalist idea and the textualist idea. So the originalists. So if you hold to an originalist sort of philosophy of interpreting the Constitution, you're going to be looking at um, how what, what was the original intent, that's the phrase that's often used, uh, behind uh, the creation of a particular part of the Constitution or behind a particular law that's being questioned in the court. So, so you'll see a reference to um, the debates that occurred surrounding uh, the ratification um, to letters that were written back and forth to sort of figure out what that original meaning was. Um, and then a, a, these two ideas go together um, oftentimes, but the textualist approach um, isn't quite as much concerned about um, trying to figure out um, what, the, what the original motivation was. They're just saying, okay, what do the words mean? Yep. Um, let's just do a simple sort of hermeneutic and figure out how the words are put together and figure out what they mean and what they allow us to do and what they don't allow us to do. And in some ways, I guess what I'm pushing towards is those kinds of, whether you're an originalist or a textualist, these lead to much uh, sort of narrower interpretations of the Constitution, right. which, by nature, a narrow, a more narrow interpretation of the Constitution um, constrains the power of the federal government uh, by, by limiting uh, or by preventing expansive reading of the Constitution. Uh, you're preventing uh, expansion of federal powers in a lot of ways because so many powers were reserved to the states. I think that's generally true. Although what's interesting about that with these recent judges is they do seem to be within the kind of the powers that you have at the national level. They actually, these new judges, I would say, seem to be fairly sympathetic to executive power, and that's and that's kind of an interesting tension mm -hmm. in kind of because I, I would generally would agree with that, but I think then that you also have that piece, and I, I don't know how it actually those put together. Yeah, well, and on the on the executive power point, part of the reason why some of the judges, including some of the originalist ones, um, have tended to be more open to a powerful executive is because the Constitution is intentionally vague on right. executive right. powers, right. right? And that was actually by design, <laughs> and you can look and read. Alexander Hamilton talking about why we need a more powerful executive and why we don't need to have a lot of parameters around what the executive is allowed to do. So was strategic was vagueness a strategic action in the same way that certain compromises were in the Constitution or certain ideas left uninterpreted or unexplained so that there was buy-in from different constituencies? It, there's probably some of that because if you read the Anti-Federalists, um, they are very concerned that the executive is going to become too powerful uh, because there weren't enough explicit sort of checks on what the executive would be allowed to do. And because it was very vague, um, that allowed Alexander Hamilton a little bit more wiggle room um, in saying, like, no, this isn't going to be a problem. Um, but, but it was very clear that a, a much more powerful executive was needed because there basically wasn't an executive under the Articles of Confederation, and that caused a lot of problems. And so he did advocate uh, quite forcefully for an executive that wasn't constrained too much. Well, this sort of bridges into the next question I want to ask you both, and this is a personal opinion question on both of your parts, and see where you come up with on this, but to your, uh, in your opinions, what's the biggest change that has occurred in the Constitution from its publication until now? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on the really obvious one, right, which is that when we write the Constitution, one of those compromises that I talked about earlier and that you referenced as well, right, is that three-fifths compromise, right, which says, um, you know, and this is basically a way of trying to deal with the kind of north-south tensions, right? How do we think about people who are in slavery, right? Um, how do we count them, right, for purposes of taxation and representation? And we count them as three-fifths of people. And when you think about, you know, the ideals of the Constitution, this is not about ideals, right? This is just sort of what they could agree on. This is that practical solution, right? Um, nobody's holding this up as like, wow, that's that's beautiful. I'm, I'm amazed we came up with such a wonderful concept of how to deal with this, right? It's a it's a compromise. 
Um, and of course, you know, some 70 years into our history of being governed under this constitution, um, the tensions arise on this question of can, can we own people in a free society to the point we fight a war, right? And the, in the war, right, the North wins, the South loses, and we abolish slavery. Um, and so we passed three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and the 15th, that are very directly about rectifying the situation, right? We're going to make people who are excluded from the citizenship bargain now part of the citizenship bargain. We're going to make it clear that the federal government can, in fact, or the national government can, in fact, intervene if the states are um, violating the rights of those citizens, although it actually won't largely do that for the better part of a century, right? But, but at least on paper, that's there. And we're going to say very explicitly, and those former slaves are not only full citizens, in every other sense, they also have voting rights. Right. And so that's a huge change. I mean, in th terms of thinking about who is included in this constitutional organ. So that's what I would point to. Okay. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of amendments to the Constitution. Sure. We could look at, so I think 13, 14, 15th are, are the post-war amendments are extremely important. We could look to a lot of other ones uh, regarding um, the, the income tax, the direct election of senators, suffrage for women. Um, I want to be nerdy and say that the, that the biggest change um, after the ratification of the Constitution was actually the adoption of the Bill of Rights. Um, because the Bill of Rights was not originally included in uh, the original Constitution. And what makes it important is that the Constitution itself, uh, when, it was, when it was developed and then when it was adopted, didn't really say anything about rights. And it really didn't have a lot of substantive content. Um, what the Constitution was up to the adoption of the Bill of Rights was what you could call a Bill of Powers. It said, here are the power relationships between the three branches of government and the relationship between the federal government and the state governments. And here's what each branch can do, and here's what the federal government can do, and here's what the states can do. It said, here are the powers that they have. It didn't really say a whole lot about, these are the things that the government cannot do in order to protect rights. Now that was, that was a bad strategic move on the part of the Federalist who supported <laughs> who supported the Constitution. And really the only way the Constitution could be adopted was because James Madison got out ahead and said, okay, I'm gonna promise all you people that we're gonna, we're gonna basically, right after we're done ratifying the Constitution, we're gonna go through a process of going through a number of different amendments that would be included in a kind of Bill of Rights. And that was one of the first things that Congress did is they, is Madison went through dozens, uh, I think over 100 different amendments, cold through, Congress considered uh, you know, the top 15 or so, and then they were sent to the states and ultimately 10 were ratified. Um, and that's why we have the Bill of Rights today. So the Bill of Rights addresses a lot of substantive issues, a lot of rights in, in a way that just completely changes everything else about Supreme Court jurisprudence um, and American politics. And it's hard to imagine what American politics would be today without the Bill of Rights. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a very positive spin uh, in terms of the changes in the Constitution. Um, can I take the negative side a little bit here? Um, yeah, just a little bit. For you. A little bit. I know. I know. That's positive. Um, I'm the designated department optimist. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's the here's what I think is the negative thing. If we look at just over the span of the existence of the Constitution, the rate of amendment of the Constitution has slowed down dramatically. Yeah. Uh, even if we hold aside the Bill of Rights, we get ten amendments all right. at once. Right. The the rate at which amendments have occurred has really slowed down, and that suggests to me that the, the Constitution itself is becoming ossified that we're, we're more and more reticent to actually think about this as a document worthy of being amended, worthy of being changed, and rather become sacrosanct. It's something that we're unwilling to consider changing um, uh, for, for really any reason. And, and that, to me, in some ways is, is troubling, I think. Yeah, I mean, changing the Constitution is really hard. And of course, the more you add states, the harder it's gotten, right? I mean, you have to get three quarters of the states on board, right? So there's a, a relatively small block of states can be blocking the amendment. Um, and so it does make it hard to make those shifts. Um, let's uh, let's get a little bit more specific here. Uh, I can't resist this question, uh, Matt. The, you got some nerdy students in 100. So <laughs> let me, this is this is one of the nerdier ones, and I, I have to ask this. So this is a little bit longer. Um, so you guys strap yourselves in. Here we go. Even though they were initially present in the Articles of Federation, and later argued for by the Anti-Federalists, why do you think the founding fathers ultimately chose to exclude term limits on congressional representatives? Are there any advantages to putting term limits on Congress? It's an excellent question. Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll try to unpack this. So, so the anti-federalists proposed a particular type of term limits called rotations, um, in which, um, and, and the student pointed this out in the question. I thought that was smart. And so, so basically, instead of a person being sort of permanently kicked out of office, they basically, once they've been in office for a certain period of time, they have to leave office and go sort of circulate amongst uh, the public, um, sort of go back to being a private citizen for a time before they're eligible to return back to office again. 
um, so that um, theoretically provides some of the advantages of term limits without all of the disadvantages. Um, we could say, we could say, well, before, I don't know if you want to jump in. I'll jump in a couple ways. And I think um, I'll add a little maybe comparative perspective here. One of the downsides to having term limits, in particular for Congress, for the members of the legislative branch, is that it, it does limit their power in relation to the executive. So one of the big trends we've seen in, in constitutional governance in the United States is that the power of the executive has grown, especially since the New Deal, New, kind of from the New Deal on, as we respond to a changing world, as we respond to the fact that the Constitution doesn't itself change very much, uh, we put more and more on the executive to actually get done in terms of governing. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, good reasons for that. Um, but one of the downsides is that does change the balance of power within our government, right? And it gives a big advantage to the executive branch over um, the other branches, and in particular over the legislative branch, which has to manage 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate. It's hard to get things done. If you put term limits on and you force there to be a continual rotation in and out, um, that actually makes the situation worse. And we actually see a, a, an example of this in our neighbor to the south, Mexico. Uh, Mexico for a long time had term limits, one term for president, one term for members of the Congress. And what that did functionally was made their president incredibly powerful because this person had all the resources of the executive branch at his disposal, right? And he could get things done. And members of Congress coming in and trying to figure out where's the bathroom, where's my committee room, right? How do I do this job? And they would do it for three years or six years, depending on House versus Senate for them. And then they would have to rotate out, right? And so that really advantaged the executive branch. So I'm actually, you know, I went through a stage of life where I was actually a pretty big fan of the idea of term limits. And the more I've studied it, um, the less things I've got for that reason. I think when you think about kind of different parts of government doing their job well, you do need people like Nancy Pelosi and like Mitch McConnell who know how the system works um, to get things done. Yeah, and it turns out you can actually take that comparative perspective and look at the 50 states, because some states do have term limits for their state legis uh, for their state legislatures, and you can actually there's actually political science literature on this, and they found that actually um, legislatures that have term limits actually have lower levels of professionalization um, and experience amongst the different um, the different representatives, um, and then actually what's really even more interesting is that when you have these term limits in place, you have all of these representatives have to have to cycle out. So, so who do you think has the power in that situation? Not only the executive, but the legislative staffers. Right. Yeah. Because the legislative staffers end up, they stick around town and they just move from, from one uh, representative to the next. And so you have these, these non-elected super uh, staffers, super staffers um, that basically wield a huge amount of influence over sort of the, the fresh blood that's constantly cycling in. And that's um, decidedly undemocratic. Right. right, it is undemocratic. And I mean, really, if you look at you know, the Federalist Papers, one of the things that they said uh, against term limits is that, you know, if, hey, if, if your constituents like the job that you're doing, there shouldn't be some sort of arbitrary rule that kicks you out of office. If you're doing a good job, then you ought to be able to stay in office, and it should ultimately be up to the citizens to make that decision um, and not have that sort of handed down because of this arbitrary law. And if we had had term limits, we wouldn't be here because Robert Byrd wouldn't have been in the Senate for 51 years. That's true. He couldn't have passed this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the benefits of uh, this podcast is I can talk with you gentlemen, and one of the things that we try to focus on in this podcast is how we, not just as political scientists, think about uh, elections and politics, but also how we as Christian political scientists think about those issues. And one of the benefits of being in a school like Bethel is we get to integrate our faith uh, with our scholarship in that way. And so uh, I, I couldn't pass up this question, which is very simple and also very challenging. Is there any part of the U.S. Constitution that comes into conflict with the Christian faith? Now, there's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an important question. And so I think maybe we could uh, sharpen it a little bit. So maybe we could sharpen it to say something like, do the general, do the general principles or particular components of the Constitution, are they consistent with a Christian understanding of politics and ethics? Um, and it's probably it's probably a mixed bag. So if you look at um, if you look at the constitutions allowing uh, slavery, uh, for example, or compromising with the slave states on the issue of slavery, um, you could see that as being sort of deeply unchristian, and deeply problematic. There's some interesting counterpoints to that about we wouldn't have a constitution if there wasn't a compromise. If we didn't have a constitution, um, then you would have had a lot of other problems, including potentially the South eventually going on and forming their own um, Confederate states um, that would have um, maintained slavery for much longer. So it's, there's some interesting big questions there. So I think there's a slavery issue. Um, and then, and then you know, like 
is a, is a constitution a Christian document? Is something that we've, a question that I've gotten a lot. And he was like, well, no, there's, there's no mention of God, there's no mention of Jesus, there's no indication of scripture. Um, there's very little discussion of religion. Um, we see in the Constitution, um, um, especially in the Bill of Rights, references to religion, right? We see that uh, Congress is not allowed to establish a state religion, nor, uh, and there's also a provision for people to have the freedom to exercise religion as they see fit. As they see fit. Um, but really, the Constitution doesn't say a whole lot about religion because ultimately he left that up to the states. A lot of the states had established religion at the time. And in order for the Constitution to be passed, um, the Constitution had to remain pretty neutral on that question. I, I could ramble on, but. Yeah, that's good, I think. I think I would just add one thing there, which is, you know, I, I think of St. Augustine on this, as I often do with these questions. And um, when Augustine talks about sort of the Christian relationship to the state, I mean, one of the things he's really interested in thinking about is, is the state usurping those things that ought to be reserved for their, you know, kind of, people's relationship to God, right? And, and when I think about the U.S. Constitution, I think it doesn't do that, right? I mean, like, we, and we could probably level a lot of critiques about particular content and so forth, but I think one of the, the good things is it doesn't try to take um, what God should be doing, right? So we don't have the kind of tensions you have in the early Roman Empire, right, where, you know, you're actually having to sort of sacrifice to the state, right? And, and Christians are saying, ah, we can't do that, right? We can't call Caesar Lord, right? Um, and we don't have that tension. So in that sense, I would say it is broadly sort of consistent with being, you know, we can live under it as Christians and not have kind of obvious tensions, um, which doesn't mean that at times it doesn't sometimes you know, support things or allow for things that are in tension with faith. I would just add one other thing, is that you can think of sort of the particular ideals that undergird the Constitution itself, um, sort of regarding um, the, the whole point of self-governance, right, and the, the idea of a people governing themselves is, is based off of a fundamental idea that ultimately comes from Christianity that people do have an inherent uh, dignity and worth and that means that no one has the right to rule over anyone else because no one is ultimately better. We're all equally human. Um, and so, um, so that provides the basis for a system of self-government. Um, another way in which I think the Constitution is, is, is consistent with Christianity is sort of the view of human nature that a lot of the framers of the Constitution had. So you read, um, you read James Madison in Federalist Number 10, and he says that um, government, good government needs to have a, a proper understanding of, of human nature. And let's face it, humans are ambitious. Humans are selfish. And you're never going to get rid of that. Yeah, you need morality and religion to temper that, but you're never going to get rid of that selfishness. And so, so you need a system of government which takes that into account. And so the best way to do this, he says, is to create a system in which ambition is made to check ambition, in which the ambitious people in the executive are checked by the ambitious people in the legislature who are checked by the ambitious people in the Supreme Court. And if you create a system in which these ambitious, selfish, sinful people are, are checking each other, then hopefully that will allow the government not to become tyrannical and prevent um, one group of people from ultimately um, tyrannizing everyone else. So theoretically, at least, the Constitution is consistent with, with a sort of a Christian view of human nature. All right. Um, what, I, what I want to do, and I think I'm not going to, is um, <laughs> Ask you for your own James Madison wish list and what uh, um, what, am what amendments you would have for the Constitution given the opportunity. Um, I think what I will do instead of that is it looks like Sam's holding on to a couple of questions from the audience here. I want to see what, what what the audience has for us. All right, I have a couple, and then I know some other folks. If you have questions, I'll come around once once they start answering this. If you have other questions. Um, so this person gave me two options. We're going to start with the uh, the, the multi-part one. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, clearly from a historian here, so they want to play a little more counterfactual history. So, uh, what is an example of a constitutional debate in 1787 that might have resolved differently? How might this have played out over decades or centuries to come? So where there was maybe a tipping point, and you know we went one way, but had the other had the other decision be made, how might that have affected? You know, the last 200 years. As a as as the non-constitutional folk the person here, can I take the easy one? Sure. If if we had not made the compromise between the in the bicameral legislature uh, between the Senate and the House, and and we had aired perhaps to say to reward population centers, um, I could see as the United States industrialized more and became a more urban state that um, 
it would have dramatically shifted how we do electoral politics at the federal level without, um, where you really would see a real marked decrease in the power of, of rural states and rural areas. That would be the good one, I, good one I'd throw out. I think you, you could also imagine that they would have come to the Constitutional Convention and, and not thought about writing a new constitution. Right? I mean, like what they were really charged to do is actually come and revise the Articles of Confederation, mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. adjustments. Sure. And so you come and you maybe fix a couple problems at the moment, um, which probably continues to leave the power almost exclusively with the states. You do that long enough, and the states develop increasingly sort of separate identities, maybe regional affiliations, and maybe you don't end up with the United States, right? Maybe you end up with a, a North American continent that has a number of, of kind of state groupings. I mean, maybe it's around you know the South and the Northeast, and you start getting Western states or something like that. So I think you know that that could have been thought of very differently. In fact, they were charged to do it differently, and they they just didn't. They said, you know, this is kind of a mess, and we need to start over. Yeah, and I'll, I think the three fifths compromise comes back to this, right? I think if, if there wasn't sort of a, an agreement on how to punt the slavery question down the road, yeah. there wouldn't have been a constitution, and you would have had, and who knows what would happen then, but ultimately I think you, well, as much as you can prognosticate sort of right. backwards, right. There, there would have been an eventual development of yeah. sort of two separate uh, federal systems, one centered in the north, one centered in the south. Um, which would have meant we wouldn't have had a civil war, but it would allow for um, the, the rapid development of sort of the, the southern slave economy um, that probably would have continued um, further into that century. That's true. As, as much as you can guess about these sort of things. That's the joy of counterfactual yeah. history, right? Yes. right? So which counterfactual makes for a better Netflix series? Uh, <laughs> well, didn't they already try the, the, the so. last one? I yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Chris, I feel we all feel bad that we've been talking about America. You do IR. So this one uh, has more of an IR tinge to it. Okay. This is somebody who uh, interpreted Constitution a little more broadly. Um, so enough about the colonies. Is the British Constitution currently in crisis? Will it survive the Boris Johnson era? Um, I'll take a stab at this and I want to hear what my comparatives has to say about this too. But I would say it is in crisis and it will survive. Um, the idea that, uh, well, so the, the, the direct crisis, and I won't go into all the, all the depths of what Boris Johnson is trying to do here, but Johnson is taking some fairly normal things that would happen as part of routine British governance, um, including prorogation of the parliament, but he's using them uh, strategically, not just to reset the parliament and reorganize parliament, but rather to sideline parliament so that he can negotiate uh, Brexit in the form that he sees fit. And that's what's causing, well, fits. Um, uh, amongst the amongst his it, not only his opponents but also his own party, and so we're seeing some fairly incredibly unusual things happening in British Parliament, including members of his own party defecting uh, to try to rein in uh, Boris Johnson. All of that actually, I think, tells me that the Constitution in Britain is in good shape because uh, it means that there's more buy-in uh, to the no to the notions of the normative nature of, of, of the British Constitution, and that whatever happens with Johnson and Brexit. The, the underlying fundamentals of the British Constitution will probably endure. I, I would just add to, I think, like the what's interesting with the British Constitution that we refer to is, of course, there's not one in a technical sense, right? They don't have a written document that you can look at in the way we do and say, well, Article 1, you know, says this. No, that doesn't exist, right? It's their constitution, which is, as it is, is essentially precedent, right? How have we done these things after time? What are those norms we follow? Um, and there is a pretty deep buy-in. So I, I think I agree with that assessment. I think there's a big problem. I think we're, but I think that they're likely to survive. The challenge would become if the tensions become too great with the different parts of Great Britain, right? I mean, could you see England and Scotland split, right? Um, and, and that is, I, I don't think it's the most likely scenario, but I don't think it's all outside the realm of possibility either, um, that those, those tensions could get too great. Scotland could say, you know what, we're out. Um, and that would get if you're listening, not watching, Andy's dobbing blue face paint on right now. Uh, the, the show is called Election Shock Therapy, so before we end, we need to pivot to 2020 uh, really oh, quickly good. here. Good. Yeah, so I'm just curious, as we, um, as we think about the tw the, an election year coming up, are there particular uh, intersections with the Constitution or constitutional issues that we should be looking out for as we're moving into an election year, this particular election year? Constitutional issues for electoral politics, or just this particular election? 
I mean, we have the, the perennial, I guess, every four-year discussion of electoral college, right, which always seems to accompany um, our presidential elections. So you'll probably see discussion of that um, at some point. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be a main feature of any of the uh, platforms of uh, any of the candidates, um, but that's something that, that could be discussed, especially since uh, Donald Trump won 2016 without uh, winning um, the majority of Americans' votes, but yet he still won in the Electoral College uh, due to the way the math fell out. Um, so you could see that being a potential sticking point. Um, you guys have other Mo thoughts? Most Americans react um, uh, strongly against modification of the Constitution. That's more to my point about the Constitution becoming an ossified document and people unwilling to touch it. Right. That said, um, if there's any way that the constitutional issues come up regularly in our political discourse, it's the Second Amendment. Um, and it's uh, trying to figure out how we uh, might implement legislation surrounding gun control without it coming up, running afoul of, of the Second Amendment. Um, as we think about um, amendments to the Constitution, uh, what are the are there amendments that are that people talk about that are the the closest to actually um, receiving votes from states, things like that? Or I, this is this is a question for me and in, in sort of my ignorance about some of this stuff. But like, what are what are what's what are in the on deck circle for for amendments? Things that are close, things that have been proposed. I don't think anything's close. They the closest, I mean, the closest thing right now is there's not an active campaign for it, but it's the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which has been an ongoing campaign since uh, the 1970s. But it's um, it's a couple states short, and there's no active move to get the to get those states passage. Is there, and isn't there a time limit they'd have to adjust to, I think, for that? So, I mean, like, a lot of them times when they put an amendment process, there's like, you have to get it done in a certain amount of time. So originally there was a time frame, so I'm assuming we'd have to go back and revisit that as well if yep. we're going to get it passed. Exactly. And I think it's still is it three states short, maybe two, but anyway, so, it, yeah, it's, I mean, if they, if they were to figure out the time thing, then it's impossible. But it's hard. It's really, really hard to amend the Constitution. Yeah, no big campaigns underway to actively modify it. The last big spate of modifications um, really was 2004. Uh, the, there was a wave of, of modifications of constitutions around, uh, state constitutions around the country um, on uh, um, gay marriage bans. And all of those were overturned with Oberfell. But that was, uh, that was a significant move uh, in, in, as part of the 2004 Get Out the Vote campaign. But that was at state level, and again, that wasn't it wasn't changed by modifying the actual U.S. Constitution, but by a court case that you know interpreted the Constitution. In a way. Yep. Um, I think we have. Are we, are we at time, Sam? No, I think we're, we're good. Yep. Other stuff. Too. No, I've got. Um, do we have any? Uh, well, we've taken a few questions from uh, you've written in. Um, we're and I think we're we're just about out of time. Yep, Does we're anybody have a quick question that they'd like to ask from the audience right now? What books do you recommend about um, politics and the Constitution? The question was, what books do you recommend about politics and the Constitution? I want to be really nerdy. Go read The Federalist and Anti-Federalist. So go read Hamilton <laughs> and <laughs> Madison sure. and go read Brutus and Federal Farmer. And Because it turns out, and I, I like to tell my students this, it turns out that a lot of the debates that we're having today about what we should be doing with our Constitution and politics, those debates have happened before. Um, and you can actually go read these people who have um, really thought through the arguments and articulated them uh, very clearly and persuasively on both sides. And you can learn a lot by, um, by reading, reading these, these documents that were written 200 years ago. Turns out that they're actually quite relevant. But I don't know, maybe there's some more recently published book. I'm sure there is, but I think, I think going with the classics answer is probably the best choice right to wrap this up with. So. Um, we need to sign off here, um, but let me thank our live audience for being with us today on Constitution Day. Thank you so much. <laughs> and on behalf of my colleagues here at Bethel University, you've been listening to Election Shock Therapy. You can always get a hold of us at electionshocktherapy at gmail.com. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> Chris, I'm Chris Moore. You've been listening to me, Andy Bramson, and Matt Kukum. And on behalf of my colleagues here at Bethel University, thanks for listening, and go Royals. <laughs> Thank you all very Thank much. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. <laughs>